Okay, uh, so in this lecture, uh, we're going to cover a new concept. Uh, so we've uh, this concept is uh, polarity and partial charges. So we've talked about two type of bonding so far. We've talked about ionic bonding, and we've talked about covalent bonding. And within covalent bonding, there's two different types of bonding. Uh, one called nonpolar covalent bonding, and one called covalent, uh, I'm sorry, polar, polar covalent bonding. Okay, so if you remember something like LIF um, is an ionic compound, so if we drew the Lewis structure for LIF, it would be Li plus cation and F minus anion, and they're not physically attached to each other, they're not sharing electrons, right, but they are attracted to each other because the positives are attracted to negatives. And if we look at an example of covalent bonding, a molecule like H2 is a covalent bond. How do you know it's a covalent bond? Because that's what lines mean, right? Lines between atoms mean covalent bond. Remember what that means? That means they're sharing uh, electrons between them. So the question is, are they? If we take something like H H two and HCl, so they're both attached by one covalent bond. So they're both sharing electrons. Uh, but the question is, are they sharing electrons equally? So if you took H two for example, and you looked at the electron density map. So its electron density map would look something like that, where it's, as best as I can draw it, it's symmetrical between the two atoms, so perfectly symmetrical electron density. Uh, whereas HCl, the electron density Uh, looks more like that. It's high electron density towards chlorine and low electron density uh, low electron density towards hydrogen. Alright, so how do you know this? Uh, to know this you need to know a new concept and this new concept is what is known as electro electronegativity. So electronegativity is defined as the ionization energy of an atom. If you remember what that is, it's how much energy is required to remove an electron from an atom, uh, plus an atom's electron affinity. If you remember what that is, it's the energy associated with adding an electron to an atom. And if you add the ionization energy and the electron affinity and divide it by two, you get what's known as an atom's electronegativity. So every atom in the periodic table has an electronegativity associated with it. Uh, and the scale of electronegativity is 0 to 4. So 4 meaning high electronegativity. So basically what that means is it means atom wants electrons. And the low electronegativity basically means that the atom does not want electrons. So these electronegativity values for each atom is given on the periodic table. So if we look at the periodic table, so fluorine, for example, has the electronegativity of 3.98. So it is the most electronegative atom in the periodic table. And if it, uh, whereas something like francium has electronegativity of 0.7, so it's one of the least electronegative atoms in the periodic table. So in general, electronegativity increases, so as you go across the period, uh, electronegativity goes up, and as you go up a group, electronegativity goes up. So basically, as you move that way on the periodic table, the electronegativity increases. So fluorine is the most electronegative atom, and so as you go up the halogens, electronegativity increases. For example, as you go across period two, electronegativity increases. <clears throat> 
So for so chlorine has electronegativity um, 3.16. So this is the on your periodic table that you're given in class. It's the number in the upper left hand corner. So if you, fluorine, if you look at your periodic table, is 3.16. So if we go back to HCl, chlorine has electronegativity of 3.16. Hydrogen's electronegativity is 2.20. So chlorine wants electro, electrons more than hydrogen does. So it's going to pull electron density towards itself. And so you get high electron density around chlorine and low electron density around hydrogen. So chemistry, like, <clears throat> like everything else, has a lot of chemistry is done computationally now. There's software that can do this. So if you model HCl and measure the molecule's ultra-negativity using the software, so what the software typically does is it uses red. So red equals high electron density. And the software typically uses blue. to represent low electron density. So this will be something that you have to do on a test as I give you a molecule and you'll have to indicate which atom has high electron density, which atom has low electron density, um, but you're not going to have crayons to do this with in, in a test. So how does a chemist typically represent electron density is by using these symbols. Uh, so that's a Greek letter delta. So that would be delta. So this is expressed as partial negative and this is expressed as partial positive. So partial negative equals high electron density and partial positive equals low electron density. So the atom that's more electronegative is always going to be partial negative and the atom that's least electronegative in the two atoms in the bond is going to be a partial positive. So if we draw HCl again, then instead of using the electron density map to rec represent electron density, we can simply use these symbols. Hydrogen is partial positive, chlorine is partial negative. And worse, if we had H2, in this case, so two hydrogens attached to each other, same electronegativity off, obviously, so one doesn't favor electrons more than the other, so the electron density is going to be per perfectly symmetrical in the molecule. And so no atom is partial positive or partial negative. Okay, so if we take another molecule like CO2. So that would be its Lewis dot structure. So which atom is partial positive, which atom is partial negative? So we just have to go to the periodic table and look at the electronegativity values. So oxygen is 3.44. Carbons 2.55, and, and again on your periodic table, it's the number in the upper left hand corner. So carbons 2.55, oxygen's 3.44. So oxygen's more electronegative than carbon, so oxygen will be partial negative, and carbon's partial positive, and the other not, oxygen's partial negative also. So this would be, so in CO2 or in HCl. This would be what's called a polar covalent bond. Uh, whereas in H2, this would be what's known as a nonpolar covalent bond. <clears throat> okay, so if we take another molecule. So that molecule. <clears throat> Um, so again, so oxygen's electronegativity is 3.44, carbon's 2.55, hydrogen's 2.20. So oxygen's partial negative and carbon's partial positive because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Uh, so the carbon oxygen bond would be a polar covalent bond. So at what point does a bond become polar versus nonpolar? So nonpolar covalent bond is typically if the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms is between zero and, uh, well, let's say 
less than 0 0.4 difference. <clears throat> it's a polar covalent bond. If the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms is between 0 0.4 and 2.0, and if the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms is greater than 2.0, then that's an ionic bond. So we see this in lithium fluoride. Right, lithium's electronegativity is 0 0.98, and fluorine's is 3.98. So a difference of three, so this would be uh, an ionic compound. And then back to this molecule. So since carbon is 2.55 and hydrogen is 2.20, so that difference in electronegativity is only 0.35. So the CH bond then will be a nonpolar uh, nonpolar covalent bond. And so if it's a nonpolar covalent bond, so technically carbon is so it's more electronegative than hydrogen, so carbon should be partial negative and hydrogen should be partial positive. But when it's a nonpolar covalent bond, the difference in electronegativity is so small that's essentially ignored. So don't use partial positive, partial negative for nonpolar covalent bonds. Right? You only use partial positive, partial negative for polar. Bonds. Okay, so just one more quick example. So if we had this molecule. All right, so which which bonds are polar covalent, which bonds are nonpolar covalent? And again, to figure that out, you just need electronegativity. Yeah, so in this example, so the difference in electronegativity between nitrogen and hydrogen is the difference of 0.76, so the NH bonds are polar covalent, and then it's appropriate to use the partial positive, partial negative signs, so nitrogen would be partial negative, hydrogen partial positive, hydrogen partial positive, and carbon, so electronegativity is 2.55, so 3.04 minus 2.55, so it's at 9. 0.49, so that's a polar covalent bond as well. So that's a polar covalent bond, and carbon would be partial positive also. <clears throat> and then all of the CH bonds, the difference in electronegativity is only 0.35, so all of the CH bonds are nonpolar covalent bonds, and all carbon carbon bonds are nonpolar. Nonpolar covalent bonds. And so it would not be appropriate to use partial positive on any of the hydrogens or, or on that carbon because all of those bonds are nonpolar covalent bonds. Even though technically the hydrogens are slightly partial positive because carbon's more electronegative than hydrogen, uh, chemists generally just ignore that though because the electronegativity difference is so small.